Thank you, Mr. Chairman, integrated friends and colleagues. We have something that is, in fact, absolutely impossible. We are trying to suggest that whether you have lost structure or function in the human body, wherever, in teeth or in feet, it's possible to either replace by uh, biology and grafting or by sophisticated technicalities. Now, what we really would like to tell you is no one knows which is best. There's only one way to prove it. That is to report everything that has happened over half a century. And um, let me first just indicate to you all problems and you see that uh, you can have the mechanical lady, you can have the uh, replacement, mechanical replacement, but you can also go all the way down to the uh, cell and how you can make a living human cell at live together for a lifetime with a piece of titanium. No one can, can uh, explain. And we don't know to, ne to, to really explain it. If we tell everyone what happened when it didn't work. So, now, what we start by saying that the two most important parts for us now and for the patient is, of course, the uh, cranium facial region, the intraoral problems, and then we now introduce also the hand, because the hand and the cranium axial region occupy most of the human brain. And this is something very, very important to remember when we talk about what to do for the patients. And then, of course, today we celebrate the meeting in Toronto in 82 with Professor Scalak and Professor Sarp. And at that time, no one believed in us integration. And we were very, very cautious to say that this could be something for the future. But because of these two friends, we did arrange the meeting. And it turned out that after that, it has exploded all over the world. To the right there, you see, what we suggest is you take a simple piece of titanium, screw-shaped, uh, a special design and so forth. You introduce it with very gentle surgery, very gentle engineering, and with control of functional load. To the left, you see all the complexities. And even if we don't understand how this could work, it doesn't matter if we don't make mistakes and don't hurt the patient. The first patient treated was just a Larson in 65, and he got all his life a good restitution, successive application of the various developments uh, of the technique. And it turned out that our colleagues in all disciplines where you work in the skeleton participated, critical and also questioning. But because they questioned, then we could slowly avoid rep repeating mistakes. This is a very classical picture. It's from 79, Sister Mary, a nun, who was the first patient from North America who got teeth. And she wrote to us each Christmas and sent her blessings. So I give you this as a philosophical comment on how we work together with the patient, with our colleagues, and how we question. Or we don't question and say, even if we don't understand, we listen to Mother Nature. In the early days, we looked into the human tissue. How can tissue survive? Because there is a circulation. And this is the vital microscopy of medical students. And that gave us the feeling we must be gentle, we must be careful. We should not hurt the tissue, and we should see when 
there was a possibility to avoid unnecessary problems. And here are colleagues from all over the world participating. Let's look into the human life. And the human life is the circulation of blood as a living tissue reaching out where it should be. Now you see, this is unique. No one else has seen it before. We did this 40 years ago. You see the red cells, you see the uh, endothelial cells, you see the white cells, you see the plasma cells, you see, and here you see the healing of a wound, the integration of titanium. So the propagation of the, the pulse pressure into the wound in, in the tissue. And you see the formation of a new capillary for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. And now, into the bone tissue, the enormous circulation. And remember, according to Shen, bone tissue can only take 42 degrees centigrade of temperature increase. Then you would coagulate it. So you have to be very, very cautious and very gentle technique. And that is the key to making predictable reconstruction of your patients. Let me share with you something that touches my heart. In 92, we treated this cancer woman, Isaura, in Bauru, Brazil. She had a major defect and no teeth and a lot of soft tissue lost. So we introduced fixtures and with collaboration between surgeons, technicians, prosthodontics, and then together it was possible to give her a stable retention, a stab stable anchorage for her new face and her teeth and her mind, peace of mind. And this then in the year 2006, and she's still in very good shape. And she is the motivation for us to continue, even if we don't understand how it could work. We are grateful to Mother Nature that it works. And now, let's see what uh, happens in li living life. And her <laughs> grandchildren e enjoying <laughs> the sorrow <laughs> events. This lady, this lady, Isaura, is a good representative of the interaction between advanced science, advanced surgery, prosthetics, and patients who are dedicated to survive. And who, if you ask them, why didn't we ask the patient? If we ask the patient, she says, this is all right. I don't want more surgery. You can move tissue, but not. And then here you see a major defect in the military uh, treated just a year ago. And despite the major problem, He's in good shape now, can join society, and when he leaves his house, he can look into the mirror and say, well, it's me. And then, you see the center, the global center, where Isaura and other patients demonstrate the stability of the prosthesis. And how can this work in irradiated tissue? We don't understand, but we feel that it relies on the restored circulation and very, very gentle surgery, and also the fact that we listen to the patient and she's back to an ac acceptable and enjoyable social life. So if we now want to modify or make high technology and so forth. Yes, we can do that. And you see what it looks like here in, in the x-rays. But we should give it 10 years of follow-up before we say this is a safe procedure. And only those should do it who have the experience. And Isaura says that we need the support from above. And it's interesting that her grandchildren 
don't consider her a defect invalid. No, she is still the grandmother. And that indicates that we should be careful not to academize, academize what we are trying to do to those patients who have lost function or structure. And Isaura is just an example of one of those who work with us, together with us, and explain to us less is more, safe, simple, and then you see this now where there is a major defect and irradiated, and you, f you could, of course, do major surgery. But if the patient, you ask the patient, the patient says, no, if I can walk out into the street and no one will look at me uh, in a peculiar manner, this is enough for me. And of course, also, since it's a tumor, it can come back and it's ready. So it's much better to just do a minimal kind of procedure. But then you will listen to Professor von Steinberger. He will ex explain to you that there's a development and we should be very open-minded to development, simplification, and also make it possible to optimize with minimal uh, resources, but only introduce it when we have 10-year follow-up and critical ev evaluation for d by different m means and methods, and also that we share. And please remember that the most important thing you can tell your colleagues is, and faith is, when it didn't work, if there's a failure, then, of course, why should we repeat failures? But we should be happy that together, together, without any pride and prejudice, it is possible to bring back quality of life, whether it's in the head and neck or in cavity, or if it's in the extremities, or in any other parts of uh, the body, including hearing aids, of course. So when it comes to a situation like this, it seems that, the, that we should not be defending theoretical ideas, but we should very carefully analyze. And that is what uh, Professor van Steenberger will talk to you about. How can we, in the future, make it safe, simple, affordable, available. And with that as a background, the quality of life, even of these patients, will be available. And healthcare people who work together enjoy seeing that a minimal effort could be enough, but also the most important conference you can have is the one where you report failures, mistakes, or unnecess unnecessary compli uh, compl unnecessarily complicated procedures. And this is the center that we established in uh, Bauru, Brazil, for the simple reason that we had been there since 92. Isaura came from there but also because there were so many congenital defects, clefts and so forth. And also because we love the country, we love the patients, and we have had so many friends and colleagues coming and working with us. And then, with this as a center, we are now opening all over the world. But only if we share information on problems that we can avoid and remember no one can explain how you can put a piece of titanium into the human skeleton. You know, if I refer to Einstein, he said that I can explain the theorem, but I can approve it. We can certainly not explain OS integration, but we can prove it because we have Isaura and the other patients. This is what we reported uh, at the conference in uh, San Paolo and published in the OS integration book. And please remember that healthcare, wherever it is, whatever it is, is based on cooperation, communication, 
without any pride and prejudice. And also integration, even if we never understand how it can work, we can at least together try to avoid mistakes and we can tell the patient that we'll do the very best for you. Hippocrates said, hold the hand of the patient and tell them we'll do the very best we can and if that is not enough, at least you feel that we care. And that is, to me, medicine, which includes dentistry, of course. We care, and that gives you quality of life. And remember, for instance, now, as a good example, is Aura. So, thank you very, very much. I would look forward to the continued collaboration and your critical suggestions and comments and then after that we are just in the beginning remember there are millions and millions of patients in need of teeth and feet and also in need of hearing and a, uh, a lot of functional restoration so as we say in Portuguese poderia ser pior it could be worse Thank you very much indeed. P.I., thank you again and again, time and again. You provide us with a lot of sources of inspiration, a lot of messages. I don't know where to start, but le let me start with one of the things that struck me during your presentation. You said, listen to the patient. How, would, how should we translate that into clinical practice? Do you think we should give more emphasis to the patient's spontaneously expressed wishes rather than impose onto him our viewpoints? Would you allow me to be a little brutal? Please. You start by shaking the hand of the patient, ac according to Hippocrates. You ask the patient, what's your problem? But you do not push the button of the computer. No. You look into the eyes of the patient and then you say, what's your real problem? What's the worst problem? What can we do for you? And this is possibly what we can do. Is that good enough for you? Or would you suggest something more sophisticated or more simple? Mm -hmm. And that is what we are now trying to introduce when it comes to uh, the cranium maxillofacial region and, and to the edentialism, maybe we can simplify. Maybe the patient can tell us that, oh, I'm quite all right if I have some improvement, but I don't necessarily need to look like one of those makeup, uh, uh, yes, Hollywood. I, I see. When you think about the days you just told us about, 1982, North America, Toronto Conference, very important for North America. How was your message originally received? Well, you know, I believe that it was very, very important that there was a critical attitude. When we started in Sweden uh, 10, 20 years before that, people said that, first of all, I'm not a dentist, secondly, I don't understand uh, anything about uh, the um, mm, occlusion and so yeah. forth. And also that um, it couldn't work. Of course, it cannot work. And it can't. But so what? If we don't understand, it's our problem. If Mother Nature gives us the suggestion of gentle handling of the tissue and make the blood survive circulating mm -hmm. for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof it says in the bible then you know i believe that what you and others have been doing then and when we started with you many many years ago that do it as gentle as you can and then don't overdo it but on the other hand and it's very important try new procedures simple safe and affordable, available. And when we started, and I, that is what I, I got, my, my message was that 
when we tried it first in, in animals and then in human beings, we didn't really believe that it could work. But the, uh, the, the reason why we did it was that we couldn't remove the uh, titanium the microscope. No. I see. So I think, again, my final comment is, and it's up to you and your generation, mm -hmm, to uh, really try to explain on that basis how is it possible that something that shouldn't work works if you treat the tissue gently mm -hmm. and if you avoid applying new procedures, so, so forth and so forth, until you know for sure that in this particular patient, this is a good opportunity. And if you cannot explain how it works, so what if mm -hmm. it works, if it's you do right. it correctly? Was that philosophical? Yes. I brought for you a few slides that you will probably remember. Our first tissue integration congress in 84 in Brussels. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Where we insisted that there was a need for legal frameworks for osteointegrated implants. Or this course in Holland <laughs> a bit later, where you will recognize yourself. Leo Coppers. With Leo Coppers. Or here, our orthopedic meeting in, in, in Aruba and oh, yes. your doctorate honoris causa at Leuven uh, University. Yes. And finally, the EOTC, with this cooperation between several centers um, in Europe. Now, when you think back at all those years, you know the famous song, look what they've done to my song, mom. Would you say, look what they've done to my discovery? It's not my discovery. No, it's a collaboration uh, between all of those who were in, like you and others, who were interested in trying to improve the quality of life of our fellow beings, whether they lost a thumb, a tooth, or a, f uh, a limb, or whatever they lost, or made a part of the face. And remember, and this is my final comment, even if you suffer from malignancy, and you started to remove, remove, mm -hmm. remove. Go on, because each day is a gift from above. And if you continue to work on the patients and try to improve their situation, mm -hmm. then the patient feels that you believe that they will survive. And I think that that is what together over the borders of disciplines mm -hmm. we can do. And after all, is, isn't that what uh, it's all about? Yes. It, it's, a, it's a question of trying to minimize the expectations uh, and to, to optimize uh, according to the academy. Because after all, the philosophy of life is we come, we go, we don't have that calendar, but at least we can tell the patients that we think about you, we'll do our very best for you, and then Hippocrates says, all right, continue with that. Thank you. I think we shouldn't add anything to these final comments. Thank you, PI, for you provided us with science, with philosophy, and with ethics. This is something that will last. Thank you. And thank you for decades of collaboration. Because after all, cooperation, communication, and enjoy the smile of the patient. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you.